and welcome to Shred Cells episode 74. I'm your host Alex Schmitz and with me here today is Peter Frank. Hello. And Andrew Gleason. Hi. Hey there guys, We're, it's been a little while since we've done a podcast since uh, spring break and me shooting my movie, but I got that done now and we're here today to talk about an anime that just concluded today, Your Line April. Uh, I forget the Japanese title, but it is an anime that began in 2014, finished in 2015, done by A1 Pictures that we'll be talking about today, one I've been watching week to week for uh, close to six months now, I guess it's been. So, but before we dive into that, we're going to talk about a bit of news and the animation we've watched since last time. Um, so, the director, uh, the guy who directed um, uh, from, not from Up on Poppy Hill, uh, Secret World of Arietti at Ghibli, he came up with a film last year called When Marnie Is There that is coming over to the West here hmm. in, at some point. I don't know exactly when, but it is coming over. I'm really looking forward to that because I re- quite liked Arietti. Um, but a, he was talking about his next film, and he said he wanted to do one that's more exciting and playful than uh, Marnie, because Marnie's kind of like a slow, you know, emotional movie between like the t- two girls in like England based on a English novel of some sort. Um, but also, ha- he has apparently he like left Ghibli after he finished the movie um, because Ghibli's falling apart. Yeah, kind of, and that, that was sad to hear because like if, if of the young direct younger directors at Ghibli, like he's the one who has like the most prominence. I feel like. Can you blame him though? I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't really know what the situation is there because apparently they're still they're still open and they're still doing something, but not working on a movie. So I don't really know what they're doing. It's weird. Um, then uh, this is kind of cool. Psy Games is the company that made um, the Rage of Bahamut game that the mm. anime was based off of. Oh wait, oh wait, that was based off a game first. It was. It was, oh. it was based off an online card game, but the anime has like nothing to do with the game, like at all. It's, wait, wait, you mean it's not wait, about people it playing about card cards? games on motorcycles? I know, right? Shocking. But God, I'm compelled the point? by that concept. <laughs> card games on motorcycles? I am super compelled by that. Card did games that? on motorcycles. That sounds like an original concept. I've never seen that done before, and that could not possibly be bad. In any way. <laughs> any way. Nope. <laughs> sounds fantastic. I, I couldn't even exactly. imagine a bad version of that. So Rage of Bahamut turned out to be a pretty great anime, actually. I and so, watch that. And I guess it must have been pretty successful because Psy Games is establishing their own anime division to make Ooh. animations presumably Shiny. off of their other games. Huh. So that's cool. Hopefully you know. they're not horrible sellouts. <laughs> like... Cash-ins. That, that's a better term for it. Cash-ins. That's Cash-in, it. not a sellout. Sellout. Well, I mean, it's not selling out when you're just, like, making more things. <laughs> for your own things. Yeah, so yeah. it's a cash-in. It's a cash-in. That's what it yeah. is. Well, Shameless yeah. cash-in. And if they could find ways to, like, do what they do with Rage of Bahamut and, like, create a story that's set in the world of the game but not, like, directly tied into it so they're not, like, who's show who, uh, sh- who's, what was I saying, horseshoeing in you know, some stupid game mechanic into an anime, you know, like card games on motorcycles. That, that was no, awesome. I don't know what you're talking about, Alex. That sounds like the best thing. <laughs> yeah, let's synchro the, summon things. What does that mean? <laughs> Nobody <Synchro> knows. <laughs> synchro what? Synchro summon. I don't even, what is that? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, no. uh, every time we make that joke, our roommate tries to explain it to us. We're like, no, we like it better this way. Well, <laughs> I actually know how, no, no, it's fat. We're better off like this. <laughs> we're better off it's not uh, knowing. <laughs> And then the last thing, um, there was this kind of cool thing. Um, there's a guy named Henry Thurlow, who's a in-between animator at uh, Studio Perot, which is the studio that does, like, Naruto Bleach. They do a bunch of stuff they do in Tokyo Ghoul this season. He's, like, an in-betweener there, an American working in Japan. Um, Those exist. I like, know. Well, it's a what? rare thing. No. I know, right? That's weird. So he did a Reddit AMA where he just answered questions. Inspiring min- millions of... We anime abuse. fan weeaboos in America well moved to Japan not exactly because he basically talked about how like he was working in like New York as an animator mm-hmm. and like he got to work on like one project that was like creatively interesting but like the rest were like really you know boring and suckish and you know he was making a, a decent enough living to have like an apartment in New York you know but he yeah, wasn't satisfied at all yeah, so, decent living. so then he moved to Japan you know uh, took him like three years or something of like sending in applications, you know, and going to interviews before he actually got, you know, a, a gig as an in-betweener, which is like the lowest rung of the ladder at an mm-hmm. anime production company. And he basically talked about how like they get, pa- they get paid like not an hourly wage, but like by drawing. So, and at the place he started working at, it was like $1 per frame you drew. And s- <laughs> but then at, when he got to Perot, it was like two to $4 per frame you drew. Whoa. Ooh, but oh my God. But Slow that down. still means he's making about like a thousand dollars a month. Which is not like a living wage, like at all in Tokyo. No, no it is not. <laughs> so basically, going on about how like you know the hours are really long and you know the pay is minimal at best, 
but like creatively he's like completely satisfied because everyone's really passionate about these projects and that sort of thing well yeah they better have they better be getting something out of it because evidently it's not money yeah well and that's, that's something i've learned from my bit of research in anime and watching shiro bako and stuff uh th- nobody pretty much nobody is doing anime in japan for the money because if you want to make lots of money there are a lot better ways to do it than that people are doing anime because they want to do it because they love it you I, know? I mean i guess that's a good thing but is it weird to ask for enough money to eat yeah well that, it is weird uh i guess like it has something to do with tezuka who is the like godfather of manga and anime astro boy creator mm. um who he's you know, the first anime came out of his studio and he's the kind of the one who set up like the practices for like limited animation. And I guess things haven't evolved that much since that time in terms of like pay grades and, you know, how things are done and things like that. So, you know, it's still a very, you know, kind of messed up industry in that regard, you know, and how much they're being paid. But because anime production companies don't make that much money, you know, they make their money off of like DVD sales and merchandise sales and that sort of thing. And they have to pay the TV broadcaster like a lot. Most of their budget goes into that, just paying for their anime to be put on TV. And it's it's usually at a late night block, too. So it's interesting to go into like the economics of how anime works. And what's to say is they do not. (laughs) <laughs> Indeed. And now we move on to the animation we've watched since last time. Um, I've just been keeping up with, you know, <laughs> weekly shows I've been watching. Um, one that actually has been really good that I haven't talked about much on the podcast uh, is um, Seikano. It's the the full title is like Seikano How, or How to Raise a Boring, Boring Girlfriend, I think. It's like a visual novel or light novel. That's what it's based off of. I'm not exactly sure which it is. Um, but it's actually been like... I was worried it was going to be like a harem fan service show, and it's a little bit of that, but the characters are actually like really compelling. And my biggest problem with it is that it's all about this guy trying to make like the ultimate light novel game and like gathering all these people, these creators, like a writer, a, you know, illustrator, a music creator, you know, in order to make this game. Uh, but then the goal is nowhere near within sight, and the episode and the show only has like 11 episodes. So it's one of those shows that's like really good, but it doesn't feel like it's going to end properly by the time its episode count runs out. So either it's going to announce a season two at the end of that 11th episode, or I'm just going to be really disappointed because it will end like halfway through and that will be it. I feel like that's false advertisement, though, because it's got really well-written characters, apparently, but it's also called the bore- How to Write a Boring Girlfriend or something like well, that. Well, it's it's all – it's very kind of meta. Like it, it points out – point uh, pokes fun at like its own light novel tropes a lot. You know, and like, because uh, the characters are all otaku, so they know, like, you know, the tsundere childhood friend archetype, you know, and that sort of thing. So they talk about these sorts of things. And the girl who's like, seems to be the main love interest, you know, is like this girl whose whole shtick is that she's like completely average and kind of boring and plain to the point that sometimes the camera like cuts her out of the frame and you don't see her. But then she like <laughs> responds to this otaku protagonist in like just these really, you know, kind of matter of fact ways that's actually like really ironically very entertaining and like refreshing because she's not anime character she's just very normal and that's actually kind of unique <laughs> so it's fun in that way imagine that we've gotten to the point where it's a ama- where it's unique and interesting to be to write a normal person to, or to write a person yeah in a tv show <laughs> <laughs> i know well if you watch the actual <laughs> show you get what i was talking about Doesn't they, they play fun with it, it. But, say but something about shows like, do that sort of stuff yeah i mean you know i mean we were just watching carter and we were super impressed when one of the guys was slightly less sexist. <laughs> Emily was less than impressed, though. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I was like, yeah, I mean, at least you think it's He's not weird. horrible scum. Yeah. He's just scum. He's just normal scum. Yeah, just kind of scum. There well, you go. You know, yeah. So, yeah, been watching that, you know, Yaderman Knights, Garo, Tokyo Ghoul, Shirobako, you know, um, Parasite actually has picked up recently. So just been keeping up with things I've been watching. Pete, how about you? Nothing. <laughs> N- nothing over spring break? Uh, not really. No. I watched some things over spring break, but none of them were animations. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. I did, um, if you're interested, I did just get Song of the Sea on Blu-ray the other day. You should watch that at and some we, point. Matt and I watched it, and it was very, very nice. I liked it a lot. You know, it's, it's, it's a simple story, but the animation and music were, like, really good. Mm, that makes sense. And it should have been Big Hero 6, but we'll go into that. 
Well, you know, anything should be in Big Hero. Literally, almost anything in that category uh, should be in Big I just, Hero. 6. The only one I didn't know about was box trolls. I probably shouldn't have beaten Big. I mean, from an animation standpoint, that could have. Yeah, I mean, if you're going solely on animation, then I guess it has an argument. It does. Um, I just haven't heard that many good things about the story, but I haven't seen the movie, so I shouldn't judge too much. Andrew, how about yourself? Um, I don't really watch any anime, but in terms of animation in general, I we finished Archer. That counts. I oh god, I forget that that counts. It's technically <laughs> animated. <laughs> yeah, it's not just, very oh, well. But. Well, I mean, it's gotten better <laughs> since the original. It's not. It's no longer just like uh, action figure joint tweens. That was yeah. funny though. It's not uh, After Effects. I think that was kind of like the idea behind. Anyway, that's no, I works. actually do appreciate the style at this point because it's very iconic, but it's also like a notably easy art style to do. It is. Um, so we watched that. I finally sat down and watched the first two seasons of Adventure Time. Oh, you that did? Was, yeah, that was a thing. How do you like it so far? It's interesting, but honestly, I don't see the excessive amount mm. of hype behind it, but apparently it doesn't pick up to the third season anyway, so that's when it grows <laughs> yeah, a plot. It pick up to the third, Appar- third well, season. Apparently that's where it grows like a plot, and like and they introduce the Lich and all sorts of other characters that start getting into people's backstories. Yeah, from what I've seen of Adventure Time, it doesn't seem like my kind of thing, although I don't think I've mentioned this. We, I think this was, maybe it was over spring break, I think. Matt, Jeremy, and I watched um, Over the Garden Wall, oh, which is a thing. mini-series that like, so like 12 episodes, but they're only 11 minutes long, and it broadcasted on Disney, I think. Um, and it was yeah. actually like very good. Like it's pretty dark and kind of like it's that kind of like a dark fairy tale coming of age story thing. And it was very nice. Uh, only problem with it, major problem with it, being that there's a exorbitant amount of musical numbers, and most of them aren't very good. Mm. So. That's a problem. Uh, Does Sonic so- Six count? <laughs> no. uh, so- uh, Sonic, 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 Boom. Sonic Boom. Boom. We did watch uh, Sonic. Boom. We did watch Sonic Boom. Oh god, it's so good. It is. Eggman is just marvelous. Confirm, we Eggman need to watch more greatest. of that. We well, do well, need to watch. More. I, I was I was watching the the two most recent episodes that I hadn't seen with um, Jeremy and Tristan the other day, and they were okay. They they did, they weren't very Eggman focused, and they weren't that funny to be honest. Was Knuckles fair. in them? Knuckles was in uh, one of them. Pretty pretty heavily which is fine okay, that's then, then, then that sounds like it's worth it they made him even stupider which yeah. well, oh no. I, I don't know i'm not the biggest fan of how stupid they've made him I don't know. i'm pretty happy like with they've turned him stupid. into patrick star at this i'm point. okay with that patrick star is amazingly <laughs> funny i know but i'm used to knuckles being like semi-competent at least well no you're used to that from like the older sonic games sonic boom it has an entirely different knuckles because that is my only way of justifying the horrible <laughs> i am now dumber than rocks character they gave him I understand that, but I did play earlier Sonic games. I love Sonic Adventure Battle 2. Because that's know. like one of the three good ones. I know, right? Yeah. Well, at least of the 3D ones. The 2D ones are good. Well, yeah. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the 2D ones, to be honest. But um, I mean, they're not better than Mario, but so they're that good w- games. So, yeah, that was the thing. And then, finally, and most importantly of the things that, in animation terms that I watched, I watched, admittedly not enough of it, two episodes, count two, of, it, of Gravity Falls. Wow, that's a whole episode more than you had last time. <laughs> yeah, you know, I watched one last night, or the not last night, the other night. Um, it's so good. I know. I'm two episodes in, and I'm like already in love. Yeah, I've, uh, I I remember. This the thing we have to do now. <laughs> I don't care if you guys do it, but I'm doing it because I'm commit. I, I remember I saw an episode at Mark's house or Mark's like a dorm like a couple of years ago and I remember enjoying it. It seems like a show I'd like. I just haven't gotten around to it. It's so good. Like ridiculously good. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe it shouldn't be that funny like really or that clever, but it is. Right. And apparently it just goes up from there and then there's like a grows a plot later. There's already hints of a plot, but I don't know. There's like two episodes then, so I guess that I can't like expect the plot to be there already. Right. Okay. Well, I'll, I do want to check that one out eventually, so I'll put that on my to-do list. Do it. It's awesome. So now we're going to move into the main topic for this week, which, as I said before, is uh, Your Line April. Um, it's this, a anime from A1 Pictures. Um, interesting. It, it airs on the Noitamina block in Japan, which is the block where, like, Anohana, Psycho Pass, um, all sorts of, like, really good, like, original shows ping pong aired there i think the tommy galaxy probably did too so it's it's become known as like one of these blocks that like has a really high quality reputation and i think the show certainly fits the quality of that block which is nice um interesting note the director of this show is some guy named kyohei ishiguro 
and I looked him up on Anime News Network. He's done episode directing on various things and like storyboarding and key animation. Uh, but this is the first show he's actually been like the director for. Like he's never directed an entire series before now. And for this to be your first series, something that's as visually impressive as this, I think is pretty, pretty good uh, resume builder. Yeah, I mean, I would be impressed if this was my first work. I'm like, hey, look, look, I made a thing. It's really pretty visually and audibly. It is. You know, going into that as well, the composer for the show is a guy named Masaru Yokoyama. So he does the original score. And then the sound director, Jin Aketegawa, who, you know, I think sound director is more like, you know, kind of overseer for the sound. And probably he might be more involved with like the orchestral music. You know, that's not part of the original score. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about this is that there's another um, very classical music focused show that I've seen that is also quite good called Nodame Cantabile. Uh, that's like about like this guy who wants to be a conductor and he kind of falls in love with this quirky girl who plays piano like really crazily. And that's a show that had like 50 episodes and really delved into the classical music side of things. Oh God, and, sounds like so much. <laughs> well, it's a good show. Uh, this Jin, uh, this uh, sound director guy, did, was the sound director for Nodame Kentabile as well, which is I'm sure is part of the reason why he was brought into this project because he has experience with that classical music thing and making that work in an anime. And... It should also be noted that the um, this anime is based on a manga by Naoyoshi Arakawa, which began in 2011 and ended in February of 2015. I remember back when the show was originally announced, uh, they they made a point of saying that the anime was going to end at the same time that the manga did. So like we were going to get the complete version of the story, which is something you don't get in some anime, which is nice to see. Uh, so... Um, Diving into our discussion of the show, I kind of broke it up into five different arcs. I kind of found where the story kind of shifts and kind of went uh, with. I can see that. With can see where things yeah. go. The first I can arc. See like, yeah, yeah, I can see the, the, the first arcs. arc being the first four episodes, basically. Mm. You know. Those four episodes. <laughs> Not always. You know, with Madoka, it's like the first three episodes kind of fit into uh, that I know beginning. Three episodes, but I'm just saying, like, it's generally four. Like, yeah, there's yeah. somewhere in there. Yeah. Gurren Logan doesn't work that way because. Three. Yeah, it's three, and then he skipped last. Well, yeah. no, it's three, four, till the time skip, and then, yeah, the time skip. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of the first things you notice about this show is that it is stupidly pretty. Uh, it is gorgeous. It is definitely like, that. It yeah. Is, it is uh, one of the most colorful anime I've ever seen, because I feel like there's so many shows that I watch where, like, the director it just doesn't much pay much attention to like shot composition or like lighting or color theory that sort of thing, but the, I don't know if this all goes to the, that director Ishigoro or to the other staff on the project, but the people involved obviously were paying a lot of attention to that in this show, were. and it pays off big time. Andrew pointed this out though, and I actually noticed it a lot. Like looking back on the show, they do a lot of like panning still shots, and it's like panning still shot of someone playing a piano like yes it's very pretty but uh, there are a lot of just shots yeah like well just, and, and, and that's a that's a very anime thing to do like you watch an anime and somebody will be talking and we'll do a tilt shot where we go from like their feet up to their face mm -hmm. because then we can avoid animating their mouth moving for that whole time and just draw one picture mm -hmm. you know so it's a it's a money saving thing and like this show actually does do a lot of like dynamic camera movements or like where the d the camera moves like around the character like it's actual 3d space mm -hmm. and that's really hard to do in 2d animation and mm -hmm. i commend them when they do do those shots because they look really nice um also one of the first things you notice about the show is that it has an amazing opening uh it's called hikaru nara is the song it's done by a band called goose house who i actually as soon as i like heard it i kind of fell in love with the song so much that i went and looked them up and they have like a whole youtube channel where they like put up covers of songs and they have an uh, presence on iTunes and things like that. So they actually have a decent American presence. Wow, that's actually weird. That, is, like, actually. I, that's hard to I like, find. Well, I like their well, name. Goose House. <laughs> it is a good name. <laughs> it's a threatening name. Because <laughs> gooses no, are scary. Imagine are scary. a house filled with them. Ah. <laughs> I, yeah. would, I would burn that house to the ground. And, and, and their whole shtick yeah. is that they're Ooh, like... Cook goose. <laughs> there's like seven of them in the group and they're all kind of like... Ah, every one of them... <laughs> Every one of them plays like an instrument, but every one of them can sing too. So they do like these really beautiful harmonies, you know, and that really Harmonize comes. Harmonize with me, maggot. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. That's from, uh, what's it called? Whiplash, right? No, it's Attack, Attack on, on Titan, Titan, Titan Bridge. Although oh. I, were, I was making Whiplash comparisons 
literally the entire show. See, so it's funny. I might have to find it again yeah. on Facebook. Somebody posted a video of um, Tenzin from Legend of Korra, but put in uh, his character's dialogue oh God, from Whiplash. That. So he's just cussing out the characters. It's, it's great. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of it. So yeah. I'll, oh God, it makes me happy inside. So, yeah, I'll have to find that. But yeah, yeah I just have to watch Whiplash sometime. It's good. Yeah. I promise it's good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do want to see that, if only to see his performance. Um, oh, yeah, but, that yeah, that first opening, like, it's honestly, like, top five tier quality for me. Like, I really, really loved it. Um, second one, good opening. You know, not as good as the first, eh. but a commendable effort. It annoyed me. I, the the English, like, she for me. <laughs> it, it just annoyed me. Oh, come on, man. English is great. It's, it's fun every now and then, but sometimes it's really just grating. They said that word a lot, and it actually... I agreed with it a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fair enough. Um, all right, uh, and another thing that the show kind of makes obvious from episode one is it kind of, it, with a lot of its humor, it does kind of this chibi style thing where the mm. characters go all deformed and they like do their goofy things. And I read online that there's some people who really like hate the humor in the show, kind of thinking that it like takes away from some of the dramatic moments or that it just is just kind of poisonous comedy in general. And personally, I laughed at a lot of the jokes in the show. I do agree that there are occasions where I feel like they did it in the middle of a dramatic scene and it kind of spoiled the mood. Yeah, I, I agree with yeah. that a lot. There, there are, have Like the number of times that someone just walked up to him, turned into a chibi and kicked him in the kn- kneecap really annoyed me. Particularly Subaki. <laughs> like that happened a lot, but so did the other love interest and just... It, can can we not kick people? Can we can we talk? You're I know you're 14, but you look like you're 18. Can you act like you're 18, please? <laughs> I know. Well, from th- literally episode one, uh, that we come into the uh, music room and Kosei's laying on the floor in a pool of blood because the baseball hit him in the head. <laughs> Seriously, the number of, like that kid should be dead. Like, I'm, <laughs> as, I'm confused as to how he's not the one dying in a hospital bed. <laughs> <laughs> he's a tough kid, despite the fact that he's a piano student. Yeah, yeah, yeah he is. <laughs> Surprisingly. Yeah, but I don't know. I I think that the first episode isn't like the greatest thing ever, but it does do a good job of like establishing like the trio of you know Kosei Subaki. And uh, Kosei, you know, establishing, like, that he hasn't played music for two years. You know, he just was, like, transcribing music for other people. You know, it's like a job. Mm. But, you know, doesn't touch the piano. And Tsubaki kind of wants him to get back into it. Um, but the po- the moment that kind of sold me on the show was when he went to the, the park and you heard uh, – Kauri playing and she's playing the trumpet song from yeah. Castle in the Sky. That was literally my favorite part in the entire anime because that is my favorite song from Castle in the Sky. And I was like, hey, this is adorable. It was. And they're calling the pigeons and the kids are talking about the pigeons. <laughs> this is cute. It's I'm done with this anime now. No. And then and then <laughs> two of the kids didn't I'm have eyes and became soulless monsters that <laughs> fed no, on the it's pigeons. It's really creepy. <laughs> Like I said, I think for the most part, it's pretty cute. Sometimes it's a little distracting. Like, I will no. agree. Why Why not give all three of the kids the black eyes? Why or, make the one have normal or, eyes? you know, just give them all of the kids actual eyes. I We had a very long-running joke that the uh, the thing that she said before every performance was a dark chant to Cthulhu, <laughs> and she was sacrificing all of those children to him. L.O.S. I'm L.O.S. I'm. Seriously, and then uh, it sounds, she, actually sounds an awful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like and then, uh, yeah, the reason they had lost their eyes because they looked up was because they looked on his dark visage. <laughs> so that's what happened, huh? Yep. But what about the kids who haven't even met Kauri? She's done with them already. Oh, she's uh, she's just making her way through this town. Just the getting population, all the kids. <laughs> clearly. Um, so like I said, first episode, good episode, you know, that just as the Ghibli fan in me was just really happy there. And it was just very pretty. You know, animation was nice. Uh, that Nodama Cantabile anime I was talking about earlier, it's a great show. Uh, but the biggest thing holding it back is that the visually it's not very impressive. Like when it gets to performance scenes, they'll usually be like, it'll be a still shot of like the orchestra. And you hear them playing, but you don't really see it. Or if you do see it, it'll be like a close up. And it's like obviously 2007 CG and it looks pretty bad. But this show does a lot of its uh, playing in 2D. looks really nice, you know. And even the 3D stuff, like they do 3D with, like, Kosei's hands when he's playing the piano. But it looks pretty darn good, mm-hmm. you know. So this is certainly – it may not – you know, people might argue about is it the best, you know, classical music anime. You know, maybe, maybe not. But I think there's no doubt that it is the prettiest and most visually, like, 
you know, entertaining to watch. Um, at least of the ones I guess I haven't seen that many to know for sure. But I, I saw guess. one. <laughs> <laughs> I would guess so. I but mean, the other thing I compare it to a lot was, um, and I know what this is about. That the one I compared it to was not about classical music, but it was kind of the same. Is Kids on the Slope? Yeah, th- that's certainly true. The jazz. I mean, they, they were jazz musicians, so it was slightly different. But you know. Yeah, that's true. And I should I should mention that Kids on the Slope also has excellent animation and playing. Yeah, I mean, very much two D. That one it was very much two D. They have really good playing sections, and you know, it was a love story between three to four friends. Yeah, those this this anime also kind of gave me. Um, Hints of uh, five centimeters per second. Yeah, I got that too. With how you know, because the the train, the the train, all the scenes of the train, you know, the the cherry blossoms. How Kosei is like constantly monologuing in his head and saying these not philosophical but very like poetic things. Which is we what we say. They should just be a poet instead of a pianist because it but doesn't bring back horrible memories of his abusive, abusive mother. <laughs> Seriously, I, I solved this problem a long time ago. Like, just go be a poet, man. <laughs> or a, or a jazz musician. Or a jazz like, musician. Because then you don't have to worry about following the score. Like, you know, it's Tales of the Abyss or anything. <laughs> Good oh, job making hey, a joke that very few people Took me a get. second to get that. There it is. I watched the anime of that, so I get yeah. that reference. <laughs> but uh, but I think, you know, the first episode was good, but the second episode is, like, I think the one, like, if I was going to show, you know, this anime to somebody to try to hook them, I'd say, okay, we'll watch at least the first two episodes because her performance of the Kreutzer Sonata in episode two was, like, a really, like, you know, grab your heart and you know, sit you down kind of moment. At least for me, it was. Yeah, and it was one of the few songs where no one had an emotional breakdown halfway through it. I appreciate that. Literally. That and the last one? Yeah, those two. Those are it. Yep. <laughs> Wait, no. Uh, When the two characters that we like but only showed up briefly play, they play fine. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's because they're not suffering from horrible psychological oh, no. and then, problems. And then the pr- performance with, like, Nagi and Kosei, like, they uh, didn't no, stop No, but he starts through. stealing the show like a jerk halfway through it. <laughs> he does. Just play the song. It's a, like, preschool piano recital. <laughs> well, I think it's closer to, like, third grade or something. I don't know. It's not preschool. She's supposed to be 13, but it's, she, it's still yeah. like a young grade said that piano she's recital. 13 and he's 14, but they look like so different. But, but she looks like she's 11 uh, and she, he looks like he's at least 16 did they say, did they and then they go back two years and suddenly he's like seven years old looking. Did they say that uh, she was 13? Because that does seem that does seem old to me. It's that 13. That would mean she'd still be in, she'd be in middle school and certainly seem like she was in... That's elementary maybe school. she just goes to a different school. Than I her. don't know. Or maybe she, maybe they just like maybe it's just like the cutoff light. Maybe she's like in sixth grade and they're like in seventh grade. <laughs> when you change from sixth cool. to seventh grade, you go through a huge growth spurt. Uh, I'm sorry. Apparently, he went from the size of a seven year old to the size of a sixteen year old in the time of time span of two years. <laughs> Puberty, man, it does stuff it, to weird, you. Man. You get hit with like a. Fuck. You get hit with a flagpole, and it's like, dang. Yeah, it's like in Kingdom Hearts when Sora wakes up after a year of being asleep. And he's just like, yeah, my voice is deeper now, and I'm also like half a foot taller. And I'm like, okay, you got to sleep through all. You got to hibernate through your puberty. The rest of us like, had to like literally suffer the entire through thing. It. <laughs> Thanks, man. All right, you know, and but you you notice that from like the very beginning, like she goes up to Kose and asks him, like, what did you think of the performance? You know, and he talks about how, like, those girls came and complimented you, you know, so it's obviously something they're not going to forget, you know, because that's what she's all about, mm-hmm. you know. And we get into this whole idea in the episode that he's there, he's friend A, you know, because Watari's, he's a wingman. Watari's the one that uh, carries into, you know. Mm-hmm. And it does, you know, obviously with what's revealed in the 22nd episode, which I should point out that these two literally just watched before the podcast. Hey. And I watched, like six hours ago when it came out because it just came out today, March 19th. Uh, it is weird how like long they continue this whole like Subak or Kauri likes yeah. watery oh thing. God, when so it's, it's, it's really obvious that she doesn't pointless to me. Like yeah. I, I, that's one thing I don't quite like. I feel like that was a largely pointless thing to keep going that long. It, I was kind of thinking about it myself because of like the finale episode was like pretty amazing in all respects, except the, but the the whole like, you know, your lie in April, you know, her lie in April was, was that she liked Watari, was and I'm glad that you're Watari. telling me this now that you are dead. <laughs> yeah, like the way I, I I can see her old shtick where she talked about how you know she couldn't like get into the group, you know, get to Kose like 
you know, just through normal routes, and she didn't want to talk to Sabaki about it because Sabaki was obviously in love with Kosei and all that. But then so why would using, you tell him? So using Watari, like, as a method to get to Kosei, like, I understand that. But then, like, at a certain point, you could be like, okay, I actually like Kosei, so sorry, Watari. I'm going to go be with Kosei. Uh, you, you're literally drowning in women. I don't think you're going to be hurting for it. <laughs> so. Although, that was the point, though, in the last episode that I did really like when, because he does just, like, he gets smacked, and he looks at the picture of her, and he's like... Oh, I actually like that girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you the girl that my best friend likes. Yeah, yeah. but well, like, you know. although he was a way better wingman than Kosei was, he was. Well, that's because he knows how to do it. Yeah, yeah. K- K- Kosei wasn't really. I mean, he didn't have to be a wingman for Watari. Watari was already sorry confident and talks to her normally as it is. But that was technically his job on the date. He was invited to keep the conversation going with music stuff in the event that it died. Right. Well, but he did that. You didn't even really have to worry about that because Kaori like leaves as soon as she gets the competition, so that's just the three of them in the audience. Yep. So <laughs> I don't think that was even an issue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it was all a trap. I don't know the way I see it is like pr- in Kaori's mind because obviously you know she didn't want to barge into their trio of friendship, you know, and ruin that it, from the beginning. So she's probably also not the type of character to like you know get into Kosei through Watari and then dump Watari for Kosei, you know. She would probably see that as like being you know mean and that sort of thing. It kind of is a jerk move. It, it is. It, kind is of, it is kind of underhanded. Yes. Yeah. So thus, you know, the the lie in April that everything was built upon. You know, which you know, it it fits. In, it's in character for her. It does kind of frustrate me as a viewer, just because like you want Kosei and Kari to be together like normally, and they you can't. want something to develop in one of the romance plot lines that's happening at yeah. some point. <laughs> well, things one definitely develop. Three. three? Three? Mm, somewhere in there. Because there's best friend who likes him. S- Sabaki. Sabaki likes Kosei. Kosei, Kose. Kose. yeah. I'm, I'm Kosei gonna... likes Kaori. Kose Kose likes... All right. And Watsunari. Watari likes, likes her. But yes. she also pretended to like him for a really long time, too. And then there so... were a lot of like signs of uh, Kosei's student having a bit of a crush on him, yeah, but there are also weird signs of her having a crush on her older brother, which was also weird. It was also weird. Well, I don't think it's a crush. It's more it of was a... like a obsession. <laughs> but he's my hero. But he's <laughs> my senpai, and you must notice me. I'm your older brother. Notice me, senpai. <laughs> I guess so. All right, so getting back to like the beginning arc of the show, we transition this whole thing. You know, she makes him watch for his substitute, you know, challenges him to be her accompanist at the competition and to the point where, you know, she runs to the school on like the day of the competition, like, you know, starts crying, like pleading with him, you know, to be her accompanist, you know, help me in like this time when I'm, what was the phrase again? Oh, my notes are out of order. There we go. Uh, help me when I'm about to lose heart. That's what it was. Even though you are horribly mentally scarred by your abusive mother. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, th- 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 You're not allowed to fe- be angry at your mother who beat you till you bled nope, on a nope, daily nope. basis. You're I not mean, allowed to be mad at her for that. I mean, she's not like she the taught worst. you how to play the piano. Yeah, that's not. And that's that all you're good for. That's yeah. Can we not? Yeah, she was definitely like an awful person she was definitely an awful person but i kind of equated you know bit of spoilers here kind of equated a bit to um uh clonad you know with oh, tomoya's we, we dad. made a lot of comparisons to clonad while we we're watching this because there are a lot of comparisons to be made <laughs> it's true but you know uh, all the cherry blossoms all the snow all the like all the lights, dying girlfriends the dying girlfriends <laughs> the lights leaving mm-hmm. you know floating around them when they're being happy it symbolized their love yeah, and but happiness. honestly, I kind of felt the same way I felt about the dad in Clannad is kind of how I felt about the mom here. Although the, the mom is worse kid. than although the, the dad mom was. this is much much worse. But than yeah, that dad. I mean, he was just neglectful. Yeah, because in the case of the dad, like they made him sympathetic later, and I like I was like, okay, I kind of forgive you, but you're still kind of a bad person, so I don't like forgive you the way Tomoya for, is forgiving you right now. Explanations similarly, aren't justifications. Similarly, here, like. I liked the fact that they humanized the mom, you know, in like the 13th episode. But uh, they don't humanize her a lot. I don't know. I mean, th- they humanize her somewhat. You know, I think the whole idea like, you know, I don't have much time left. 
you know, will he be able to support himself as a pianist? You know, like that's why she was like driving him so hard. Uh, yeah, know. because it's not a bad yeah, justification. Like he can do other things. It's not like he was fourteen and would find a career at 11. some point in his life. Oh, Eleven at that point, and would find like something to do in his life. No, clearly his destiny is to play the piano. Uh, he could just be a computer programmer. God, or his worst poet would be fantastic. Or a jazz musician, or what else? Because of say? being a Starcraft poet. player. Starcraft player was our Starcraft favorite. Starcraft player. That was our yeah. Just moved to South Korea. South Korea. 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 Starcraft out. player. APA. Yeah, his APM was to be like amazing. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rolling <laughs> in that Starcraft money. Oh, Actually, Starcraft, Starcraft is kind of dying out nowadays. I imagine. Uh, yeah, Brood War didn't. Uh, not Brood War. Uh, Heartless Swarm didn't do kind things to it. Yeah, it did not. Well, one, uh, whatever what it is, the, the Void, uh, Shark of the Void, something like that. Something it like might that. revamp it. It'll bring more people to it. That's true. Anyway, sorry. Starcraft right. tangent. Off the Starcraft tangent. Okay, so then episode four is the one where um, Kaori and Kosei perform, you know, together for the first time, which was, you know, like the performance episodes are like probably most most of the best episodes of the show come from those ones because that's where the animation budget goes and that's where a lot of the emotional moments happen and the cool music and all of that and uh that was definitely a standout because you know kosei starts you know they're starting doing okay you know then he loses his hearing you know falls at the bottom of the the the, the dark sea which and i was starts like, writing his dark poetry which i always love is like just a visually like i think they depicted that really well with like how you hear the thump of the notes but you don't actually hear them and mm-hmm. everything uh to the point where he stops mid competition disqualifying well disqualifying him and she doesn't get disqualified until she stops too and then turns around and says again and they start up again and then this time he actually like puts more effort into it and just kind of lets his emotions carry him and it turns into this like really beautiful like duel between the two of and them it starts the trend of them not ever playing the songs right <laughs> it's true but hey it's really frustrating it's more energetic that way i suppose i don't know i mean it, I certainly would prefer a more fast-paced version of a lot of these classical pieces compared to the slower, more traditional playing. Yeah, but when the conflict is the same conflict as the last conflict, it's not a conflict anymore. What, you mean in terms of like... Oh, I can no longer hear. I can't play the music right anymore. See, but that that's only a conflict in like the early, you know, like the first 10 episodes of the show or so are about that. But then it, at a certain point, he transitions into that becoming a gift you know, and like the fact that he can't hear the notes is like a good thing, and that just like except when it's not, him. and he's playing it wrong still anyway. <laughs> like well, when he was playing the lullaby wrong at the very beginning. Well, right. You mean the twinkle, twinkle little star in the uh, third episode? No, the um, uh, it was oh his the own ch- one. the ch- the yes. Tchaikovsky with yeah. Nagi. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that the whole point of that was to like, you know. He he does basically bully her, you know, with his playing, but he's trying to challenge her, you know, and she like rises to meet him, you know, and it accelerates her growth. I think that that's the whole idea they were going he with there. She doesn't even want to be a pianist, she just likes playing the piano. Well, but she wanted to prove to her older brother, and obviously what Kosei showed her like made her want to be a pianist. You know, that's mm-hmm. the whole part of the whole point of that arc, you know. And that that performance, like I don't know, like the energy that you get from when he plays, you know, the emotional way, you know, like letting playing for someone else, you know, letting that like guide what you do. You know, that's certainly a thesis the show is going for, I would say that, mm. you know, that leads to, you know, the most emotional, you know, uh, playing in the show. <laughs> um, uh, but the, going back to episode four for just a second, you know, the performance happens, everyone's clapping. It's great. And then Kauri collapses at the end of the episode. Because back in episode three, we saw her uh, go to the hospital while she was on the bus. So this early on, we're getting the death flags are flying up here and there, you know, warning us about. I didn't notice the hospital. Yeah. Mm. That was that was a little bit more yeah, subtle. Yeah, I do remember that because she pushes the stop and she pulls up to the hospital. And I was like, because after, um, what's her name gets off? Subaki. Okay, Subaki. I remember that. Now. Yeah. Yeah. That's a... Uh, that's episode Probably three. Subtle, actually. Yeah, yeah, good job, show. Yeah. Good uh, job, show. And, and that is one thing I will say, you know, like, obviously, it, I do think it is tough to, like, lightly foreshadow a, like, character who is a deathly illness because, you know, once again, going back to Clonad, Clonad did it, did it too, and it wasn't, you know, very uh, subtle. subtle about it, you know. It, it was not. Because no. we, we as uh, viewers are just programmed, okay, well, if you have – any sort of like long term sickness that isn't just you like the common die. cold, there's a good chance you're going to get severely hospitalized or die from it. 
you know. So as soon as that like comes up at all, we start worrying. And in the case of Kauri, they raise it like the death flag is like every episode. It's like, oh, we're reiterating yeah. this. So she's yeah, going yeah. to die. They say like she's really, literally really, taking a die. mountain of pills in the bathroom. Oh, exactly. Good. I'm sure she's fine. In case you forgot, she's actually going to die. It could have been interesting if she was like a drug addict. That would have been fascinating. <laughs> that could have been like, no, like that could have legitimately Adderall. been interesting because she cannot deal with the stress of becoming such a fine musician. So, you know, she takes drugs in order to take it. Like that would be an interesting portrayal of the like how screwed up the classical world clearly is in order to turn these musicians into something viable. That might be interesting if she didn't have the deathly illness and had knew she had like only, you know, well, a year that, to live. That could have been more interesting. The, could have been hey, interesting. There are no consequences to my actions anymore. Well, yeah, that's pretty much what she said in the other episode. I'm going to eat a bunch of cake because I'm going to die in a year, so I don't care if I get fat. <laughs> I kind of like that way of thinking. <laughs> Just live life to the fullest. Um, a cool Treat thing. Yourself. A cool thing about episode five. Um, you might have noticed that's the one where like they they jump off the bridge, you know, into the water. That episode has like a very uh, different animation look to it, and uh, that's because it was do 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 storyboarded by a guy. Where's my note here? Ah, uh, there it is. Uh, Masashi Ishihama. He's the director of uh, From the New World, uh, like an animation director on The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. I think he's pretty highlight claim guy and um he did the storyboards and it was ep- the episode was directed by him and a guy named takashi kojima who was a key animator and basically did like th- almost all of the key animation that episode was done by that one guy so it kind of had like this certain style going with it like you can see in like the way the hair moves and like you know the way that he animated like the chibi scenes with like more motion than usual it's just i i'm kind of a sakaga fan so i like knowing these little details and that episode is just really like visually you know compelling and kind of a interesting depiction of like what this kind of one man band episode looks like because occasionally you see those pop up here and there in anime and they typically are like some of the best episodes of their respective shows um so you know like i said that's the one where they jump off the bridge you know um and she she asks him there to uh, to play in a competition. You know, this kind of gets into the, what I would call the second arc of the show. Episodes five through ten are like you know the build up to the Maiho competition. Mm-hmm. You know, where he meets Takeshi and Emmy. You know, who I agree are like I some was characters so I really like. In their characters and they didn't show up nearly enough. I mean, they're not the primary focuses, but I think that I mean they they both develop by the end of the show. They have definitely both gone through arcs. They have flipped a switch because they were in two episodes. <laughs> they were in more than two episodes. They were in at least five of a 22-episode series. That's not bad. Now, the girl was definitely in it a lot less than the dude because the, cause the dude's sister ended up becoming, like, a little bit ended more up becoming like main plot for a while. So You might have not been paying attention during some of the scenes where she was stalking Kosei. I remember that. Um, no, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> where she dressed up in, like, the, like, the mask and everything, and their teacher totally recognized her. Well, see... I'm glad the teacher was there to recognize her because since she was wearing a hood to cover her all of her identifying features, I didn't recognize her. Yeah, I, I was got like, uh, oh, it's the character who hasn't shown up in forever. No, that, in that that episode, she'd only been gone for like an episode there because that's the the competition after the Mayo competition. Too long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever you say, Pete. I think you're a little impatient, but I am. so be it. <laughs> um. I did think it was interesting, actually, because I was kind of wondering when I was watch- I was rewatching episode five. Um, Kari mentioned this thing about how you know uh, people think like I can't do that, you know, but they pick up the score anyway. You know, talking about how like all musicians are afraid, and she says that's how you create the most beautiful lie of all. And I thought, oh, well, is that like the title drop, like your lie in April? You know, because I was you're kind of wondering what that was, but it was all being saved, saved for the last episode. You know, which was a cool kind of twist, I think. Um, we also have in here, there's a whole kind of mini arc with Tsubaki. Uh, she gets together with her senpai, who's now like a high schooler. <laughs> Call me senpai, you know, and, uh, you know, that does get to be kind of interesting. You know, she has her whole thing, uh, with her, um, softball club, you know, where she kind of stupidly decides that she's going to go for a home run when she only hit like a three, three baser. So much reason are like, no, just stay a third. Ugh. Clearly, that's what she should have done, but she was oh. going to show Kosei that there she was awesome. Well, no, 
See, there are times when you need to commit, like when you want to talk to Kosei, and there are times when you need to not commit, like when you're going to lose because of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it was it was a mistake, for sure. You know, but there was kind of a nice moment after that where, like, you know, uh, Kosei met her on the way home and, like, kicked her ankle because he, like, realized that she had hurt it even though no one else had and, like, carried him on – or her on his back, whereas she had carried him on her back in, like, the flashback, you know, and – I don't know. Those scenes are always nice, you know, when they when the, it's like a Sabaki focused episode. No thoughts on that? I was honestly kind of annoyed by the Tsubaki episodes because I really wanted them just to give up on Love Triangle. I have very little patience for that nonsense. Let's see. Well just, rom coms probably aren't your thing then because Love Triangles yeah. are pretty well, much pretty much what the they do. The only yeah. thing that they can fool for drama, other than making one of them die, which the show did both. <laughs> so <laughs> they do both. You know, but or making it forbidden. That's the other thing they can do. This is like literally the only three things they can do to pull for drama and rom coms. It's true, but you know, if if a rom com does it well, like makes you care about both the characters, you know, the protagonist is well, supposed to be that's in the love key. with. Is but they to... made it exceptionally clear that the Tsubaki wasn't going to be the love, in, the actual love interest, unless it was after the main uh, the main love interest died. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's... like so, I was just like, okay fine I get that you have a crush on him right but then once again going back to Clonad we could you know it was pretty obvious from the beginning and based on the opening and everything that Nagisa was the one that Tomoya was going to fall in love with there was no tension about I never felt any tension about like in Clonad when when it came to like the other characters and like being with Tomoya I agree that you didn't feel much tension because you knew that Nagisa and him were going to be get together. But at the same time, like you guys talked about, K- Kotomi was your favorite of the girls. Well, we ended up we liked the characters and the way they were developed in that show, which was the key behind it and learning about them, and their backstories. There was no tension derived from is he going to end up with one of these girls because we know True. he wasn't. Right, but my point is. Even if we know that Tsubaki isn't going to be love interest number one, we can still get invested in her character if she's got good mm. character development, which I would argue. Char- but her character her character, and character development is, I really love him. Yeah, that was really like 90% of her character was that she was deeply in love with him. And I agree, her character does have, like, I feel like they repeat themselves a bit with her in the second half of the show. And Outside that- of, like, she does start doing really well in school because she wants to be with him. But again, that's like, hey, I really want to be with Kozai, so I'm going to actually care. A <laughs> little bit, a little bit. Um, so then, as we said, you know, it kind of transitions into the Maiho competition. K- Takeshi and Emmy are introduced, which, you know, I was kind of looking forward to, too, because you watch the opening and you see these two characters playing piano as well. They look one, really happy. The one with the that. <laughs> Takeshi with his Super Saiyan hair, which always... I love it. <laughs> I mean, none of the other characters in the show have hair that's that silly. He's the only one. He has main character hair. He does have main character hair. Why isn't he main character? <laughs> Clearly. Um, the thing I think is interesting about the two of them, though, is that they're both they're both the same and yet different in that, like, both of them idolized Kosei, you know, saw him as, like, this rival, you know, and he's part of what got them, you know, to be as good as they are now. Mm-hmm. But, but in the case... For polar opposite things. Exactly. In Emmy's case, you know, she, she loved the mischievous boy, you know, who came up there nervously and played this beautiful little emotional piece, whereas Takeshi loved the robot Kosei, the one... Who that, is perfect uh, and walked out alone like, it, exactly. like, you know, an action hero. The undefeatable hero. Didn't look back at the explosion as he left. Exactly, which is why... cool guy who do not look at explosions. Which is why by the end of the Maiho competition, Emmy is, like, on board with this direction Kosei is going in and Takeshi kind of falls into a slump because Kosei has been torn down for him like his ideal of what Kosei was mm-hmm. you know which I think is interesting for sure um, and then you know they give both their performances uh, you know Takeshi kind of doing this just really intense like you know uh, very com- complicated you know piece like lots of movement of the keys back and forth you know that mm-hmm. was really cool I really liked how like at the I think it was at the end of episode 7 um, you saw like all of the people in the hallway before the competition, like freaking out. You know, you saw him in the bathroom, like almost vomiting in the sink. You know, and th- but then like he gets that confident look on his face and walks out there on stage, and you hear, "Oh, he's like the one who won this comp- comp- competition last year. He's the number one pianist." So even the guy who's number one feels just as nervous as anyone else right before going up there. Mm-hmm. You know, which is something that this show does portray really well is the whole like, you know, the the creative artist. You know. Um, kind of thesis about you know uh putting yourself out there you know despite 
all of your struggles, you know, letting your practice pay off, you know, and all that sort of thing, you know, the nervousness beforehand, you know, it, it does that really well for musicians. And I think it's something that applies to like anybody who's pursuing any sort of like creative field. You know, I think this show has a lot of themes that, you know, spoke to me at least, you know, as a filmmaker and things like that, certainly. Yeah. I w- yeah. All right. Um, and, uh, and then it's episode nine where we have, that's where Kosei gets up there to play in the Mayo competition. And that's where he sees the phantom of his mom kind of appears and is talking to him. And we get these flashbacks of her hitting him, you know, with the Again. bruises on his arm, you know, with the particularly violent one where she just beats the shit out of him. And, uh, to the point where he says, you know, I just wish you would die. I don't blame 11 I- slash nine year old slash I could argue six. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame, I don't blame him either. Although it is kind of bad that those turned out to be the last words he ever said to his mom, for she did actually die. Eh. <laughs> Man, you really didn't care about the mom like at all, did you? No, because I don't care about abusive parents. Also, parents that try to force things on their kids, even though that they. But see, she didn't. Him. She didn't. That's what's interesting. Seto is the one who was like. Hey, then the mom needs to grow a spine and tell her it's your own kid to torture and to become a pianist. <laughs> or yeah. she could have taught him without abusing him. Yeah, I mean, that too. Or, you know, just let him have a kid. Well, and it, it, was, doesn't it was like shown piano. that she did, like, you know, she told him, you know, play the piano like you're caressing a baby's head. You know, you saw those scenes of her and Kosei, you know, that were more gentle and sweet. And it kind of seems like when the mom's sickness, like, really came into effect, there was that whole I'm running out of time thing. I need to make Kosei better so he can, you know, survive without me kind of thing. You know, that's what drove her into making things more violent, you know. But I, I, I think that's interesting that the mom didn't want that life for Kosei. Like, she said, no, he's my treasure. I don't want that kind of tough life for him. But Seto was like, no, he's like a prodigy. You know, we've got to do this. You know, so it kind of ties back to her, and she feels no small amount of guilt over that, I think. Which is pretty cool. Um, not enough to not do it to another kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, Seto's a cool character, but she is not the best teacher. Like... You know, she kind of admits that to herself, like, "Oh, I'm letting this happen again." Well, go me. You know, whenever Good job. when when like Ko- when uh, Nagi ran away, she sent Kosei after him. You know, when Kosei was depressed about Kaori, you know, Nagi went to Toga- talk to Kosei, not Seto. So, yeah, you kind of rely on your students a little bit too much here, maybe. Um, but yeah, episode ten. You know, he kind of. Uh, comes out of that that despair, you know, like he plays for he decides he's gonna play for Kauri, you know, he gets the image in his head, you know, of her, you know, with his the, his coat over her shoulders, you know, in the music room, you know, which is a very beautiful scene, you know. And uh with ending with like the image of his mom like smiling like in the back corner of the auditorium. Which is nice. Um the one thing that does kind of bother me about the way they depict the mom is that throughout a lot of the show they don't draw her with any eyes. Which works which, on, on it, nerves. It, no, it does not work. No, it is it, scary. It works during the scenes where she was supposed nope. to be scary. Oh, that. Yeah, it works really well there because I'm scared the whole time. But then then there are scenes like that scene where she smiles or like there are a couple <laughs> times where you're supposed to like. Yeah, she's where you're supposed to like her, but she still looks like some soulless eldritch being. And they fixed that by like the 13th episode, <laughs> but I don't know why they, they fixed it earlier. No, no. I, I, I was Terror, literally every time she was on the screen, I'm like, ah, why, <laughs> why, why? <laughs> You're one of the eyeless. <laughs> You're clearly like a Dementor or something. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, and then we kind of get, you know, third arc of the show, I kind of call episodes 11 through 13, you know, uh, going to that the, the Toa Hall um, gala concert. That's that competition. Mm-hmm. Um, also, little note, in episode 11, starts with that uh, bit of the hero, like, shooting laser beams out of his eyes and blowing stuff up. Also animated by that Takashi, Ko- Ka- Takashi Kojima guy who did episode five. Just a cool little note because the animation there was, like, really cool. But I love Takeshi in that episode. It's after the Maiho competition, after, mm-hmm. like, K- Kosei has failed, basically, in his eyes. You know, he talked about, like, you're supposed to be unbeatable. Are you, you're, It's almost like you're actually human, mm-hmm. you know? Like, Takeshi didn't view him as, like, a person, like, at all, mm-hmm. you know? which is an interesting way of doing it. You know, Seto is introduced in that episode and we talked about kind of the things that are going on with, with her. Um, and, uh, 
and that episode ends though with definitely one of the prettiest scenes I think in the show, the firefly scene by the river. Mm-hmm. Uh, just gorgeous lighting there again. And uh, I was kind of worried, like, uh, Kauri asked him, like, uh, who did you play for? You know, play that piece for. And I was kind of worried, like, the Kose was going to say, oh, I did, you know, for nothing. Ha ha ha. You know, do a rom com sort of thing where they dodge the question. But it just says, like, you know, I played for you, you know, and like the insert song that was playing there, like, gets nice and loud there. And it's like this nice moment. Um, I do feel like, you know, I was kind of expecting at the time because I watched the show week to week, you know, episode to episode. I was like, oh, wow. So he. So that's the triggering event, right? That's where they stop pretending. Yeah, he was like kind of halfway confessed to her there, kind of, sort of, you know, so I thought that was going to kind of cause more of a change in their relationship. Nah. And it really, nah. I mean, it gets them a little bit closer, but not as much as I would have liked. She's you know? too busy dying. Well, yeah, because she, once again, you know, a- ends that episode, you know, she talks about how, you know, fireflies are small and fragile, but they burn so bright, you know, so pretty, you know, they're just like me. Ha 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 You know, uh, ending the episode with, you know, after he said that about her, you know, I'm not always going to be around to help you, Charlie Brown. <laughs> you know, so I kind of feel like, you know, in her case, maybe part of her whole shtick was that she was afraid of getting like too close to Kosei because she knew she was going to die and that would only cause him more pain. That's the best kind of justification I can come up with. And then what we talked about with the fact that, you know, she didn't want to like just dump watery, you know, off on the on the wayside. I thought that. Like, but by that point in the show, I was pretty, like, I had pretty much accepted that, that, like, they hadn't spent time, she hadn't spent that much time with Watari. And Watari was still dating other women. So well, I didn't. He wasn't dating them, but he was at least, like, seeing them. Learning. <laughs> we don't really know schmoozing, the extent of that. Schmoozing. Schmoozing. Schmoozing is a good word. I like schmoozing. We don't use that enough. Yeah. No, I, like, oh. I agree. Like the whole thing with how she, you know, was annoying. L- lies about, you know, being with Watari, and even though she's actually interested in Kosei, does come off as a little strange. Looking back on like the entire show, like why didn't you just you switch know, to Kosei? Say, at a certain I mean, point? he confessed to you and, and heavily implied for a really long time, and you were dying. You might as well have spent your last few months with the guy you actually like instead of pretending you like somebody to be with the guy you actually like, even though he's totally in love with you and has pretty much told you that, but you're still stringing him along on this plan of yours. True. But she, I mean, it's not as though they weren't spending time together. You know, they really were. But the time he, they were spending together they just involved brought, her yelling yeah. at him. <laughs> but and, they always, and she always said, well, bring him and then sit there in the back of my hospital bed quietly like you're sad. Oh. But always check on me regularly because I actually do like you, but I can't say that because I'm a teenage but there girl. Were, there were numerous scenes, though, where, like, you know, like there was a time I remember a few episodes ago where Kose was, like, going to give her, like, she came back from the hospital. He was like, all right, I'm going to give her this sandwich. And then, like, Watari came and talked to her, and he was, like, kind of depressed after that. And then he's walking along the bridge, and he sees her right there, you know. And so probably there's a good chance that she knew she was coming that way and was kind of waiting there for him. Because clearly back in episode two, she said that she was waiting for Watari, but was totally waiting for Kosei. You know, so like yeah, there, she there are t- that more than once. Exactly. There are times where she like, you know, clearly like goes after him specifically, like, you know, get, getting alone time with him specifically because, you know, she likes him kind of thing. So it's not totally averted, I guess. But, um, you know, there's this whole thing. Um, he starts up the uh, the competition, and there's uh, there's this kid introduced, Mike, the little uh, kid with the glasses. Who, like, the, like the very young child who Kosei decides he has to pick a fight with because the child said something vaguely mean about his girlfriend. Well, Not girlfriend. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say it was vaguely mean. He pretty much insulted her, like, oh, flat no. out. A 12-year-old insulted me. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. I was confused by this whole thing because, like, you're, you're right. He's 12, and I'm like, why do you let what a 12 year old not nose punk kid say to you get so under your skin? They're like, no, I now have to beat him. Like, he's 12. This like, is... if you okay, so there's a Dave Chappelle sketch um, where 
he goes and visits these little this little kid who's like dying of cancer in the house and he's twelve and he's like, Do you wanna play video games with me? And he's like, Yes, son, I will play video games with you to make you feel better. And then he kicks his butt at the video games. Suck it and just yells suck it to the kid and walks away and I'm like, Hey, that was amazingly funny. But be like that's what it's like. You're you're picking on like a twelve year old kid because he was being a jerk to you. But you're supposed to be older and an adult. Well, it was it wasn't so much like he wasn't literally, you know, picking a fight with the kid. The way I see it, Mike I'm going to steal the spotlight that you won in a contest through hard work. Well, he has the sp- he plays last, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be the best player because if the person before you is better, then yeah, you're going to look but like crap. But you're still supposed to be like the headliner, like you're the like you, you won that right to be that guy. I guess. I don't know. I, because because I think co- he he insulted not just Kauri, but he insulted like her way of playing. Like he said, you know, someone who deviates from the score, like that's that's worthless. That and so to Kose, you know, Luke was able to come and save the day. So to Kose, you know, that's like an like an attack against like what he believes in and what Kauri like embodies and all of that. And so he was like, no, I'm gonna go out there and show you just how am- because if I'm this amazing, then and I'm her accompanist, then Kauri is like that much more amazing. No, I don't think that's how logic works. <laughs> <laughs> You're just music. also a really skilled soloist. I think that just makes you a really good pianist, and I don't think this says anything about the vi- the violinist. Yes, violinist. I guess that's the word for it. Yeah. I yeah, but you you get the point, right? He was. I, mean, I get I what get he was idea. thinking. He was still Not trying right. to have a um a spitting contest with a twelve year old, which is know. still wrong because he's twelve. Well, but also and you're 14 if, and also in this this is this is in just like in the schoolyard. This is a, you know, at least semi-professional environment. You know, there, I'm sure there's it, which th- is why and they're in class they're classical musicians. They're supposed to behave with like proper well, manners right. and tact. But the point is what Mike 12. What Mike said 12 mo- <laughs> Hold on. What Mike said, I'm sh- I don't know the rules of like classical music competitions, but I'm sure what he said was like a very much taboo like you don't say that about, you know, another performer kind of thing. So Mike already cl- crossed the line. Also, we sh- we should consider Kose is fourteen. If the kid is twelve, there's only a two year difference there. It's not like well, an eighteen year old. Well, it's really visible because they draw the twelve year old looking really young and also like a monkey, and they draw <laughs> Kose looking more or less like a sixteen to eighteen year old. I don't know. I know about eighteen. I, I, eighteen is pushing it, but he's at least he looks at least sixteen. I mean, I, I will agree that like in general, they look the main cast look kind of high schooler ish more than they do middle school ish. But I mean, they are they're third year middle schoolers, so it's basically like the difference between like an eighth grader and a ninth grader going by American standards, you know. So you know, there's not like that much of a gap there in terms of physical development, but. Um, but I actually really liked how, you know, he played, you know, did really well. And then, like, at, after that, Mike went up there and was, like, super nervous. Uh, but then they humanized his character because he sees his, like, his mom out there, like, praying for him to do well. You know, he decides, like, okay, I'm going to play for her sake, you know, just, you know, to make my mom proud of me, you know. And then he actually plays pretty good, too. So Kosei challenging him in this way actually, like, elevated his playing, you know. So th- that was nice because Mike was kind of like a bratty little kid. You know, just the episode before that, but that like humanized him a bit and made him like, okay, so you know, you're not just like a one-dimensional character. That's nice. Uh, and episode thirteen was is definitely one of my favorite episodes of the show because that's the whole one where he like has, says goodbye to his mom. You know, and we get those, you know, those the revelation of like those happier moments they spent together. You know, finally we get to see her eyes. You know, that was a nice <sighs> thing. <laughs> she's clear. she's the eldritch being that they're I, sacrificing. I do think so. it was it, it was <laughs> interesting. That's why she kept beating him. Yep. It was interesting that the mom you know, mom played that that song Love Sorrow, you know, Kauri specifically chose that song for him because she knew about that. You know, it was the song his mom loved. And he asked, "Why do you play Love Sorrow instead of um Love's Joy?" Love's Joy because I want you to get used to sorrow. <laughs> it's like, "Hey, Thanks, mom." <laughs> yeah, no kidding, mom. <laughs> eh, she foreshadowed it for you. You have nothing to blame but yourself, seven-year-old kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I know I like that, and like he had a whole bit where he like talked to Seto after that, like talked about how like m- uh, mom is like within me, you know, with with everything I do, like the food that I eat, you know, the clothes that I wear, you know, all that sort of thing. Like, and he kind of like cries, like you know, to her, says, you know, that I was I able to say goodbye to her, you know, that whole thing. It it was a, it was a nice cathartic episode, you know. For me, it did humanize the mom somewhat, now not to the 
not to the point that I forgave her for what she did to Kosei, but enough that it made her like not a one dimensional villain at least. See, this part this part bothers me because it seems like the show's trying to tell him you shouldn't be bad at your mother for physically abusing you and making you miserable when you were eleven. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, you can't be mad at her because she taught you how to play the piano. Like, that's that annoys me a lot. Well, it wasn't just the that that he, she taught him how to play the piano. It was also she raised him, you know, for all those years before she became like abusive and got sick and everything. You know that the that she was, you know, kind and w- warming and all those things. Like a good mother throughout that point, even when she became sick and did the more abusive things, like driving him so hard it was for in in her mind at least you know for a good cause you know so that he would have a future after this kind of thing so i don't know it's interesting to debate um but that episode ends with another one of those like sayings i'm just kind of wince at um one of the teachers is saying like uh sorrow makes kosei's music evolve so in order to make it evolve further, he might have to lose someone else, and that plays over him running, running to the hospital where Kaori is sitting there in the hospital bed because turns out she collapsed because she didn't show up at the competition. We're like, what the hell? But of course it was collapse. Mm. <laughs> so, and then that transitions us into uh, episodes 14 through 18, which I kind of that's kind of the Nagi arc, you know, but she doesn't show up for a little while yet. Um, but that's, you know, an interesting arc of the show. Um, this is the one when I was watching it, I was kind of watching it week to week and like looking back on it at the time, I kind of thought like that this was maybe where the show slowed down a bit because it does take a while for us to get like the next big competition, but rewatching those episodes, rewatching the show, like I did before the podcast, like all in a row, I feel like it made, um, uh, those episodes like flow a lot better. And there is some like really important character interaction that goes on, you know, in the second half of the show, even if it is a little less, you know, fast paced, a little less performance focused than the first half was, um, and going to what you were talking about to me the other day, Pete, because um, I was noticing it more on rewatch, like how they would like, you know, they would end the episode here and then they would kind of recap it at the beginning of the next one. And then but add some new things to it. Mm-hmm. That, um, that annoyed me a lot. I, it, it, I do agree that they I mean, I feel like they did it a lot in the first half of the show and then kind of stopped by the second half. And then they did it a couple more times towards the end. Yeah. But um at least in, in some cases, like in the case of um, like Emmy, you remember her comp, she played the winter wind song. And then at the beginning of the next episode, it did a, a lot of her playing it again, but it was like a different, like uh, instrumental version of it. Cause there were like other orchestra instruments playing with it. And it showed like, like at least two or three more flashbacks of her, you know, like her past, like wanting to be a pianist, you know, and challenging Kosei and all of that. Mm-hmm. So like in pretty much every case, they like add new shots to it or new information is revealed. But a lot of the time what they add is stuff that you had figured out just because you under just because it's easy to figure out. Like mm-hmm. a lot of the things they say don't need to be said. Yeah, I agree. Although once again, it, it is something I noticed more in my rewatch when I watched it week to week. I, I mean, I clearly knew that like, okay, we saw this performance, you know, bit of this performance last episode, the bit of the scene last episode, but it is surprising how much you forget watching a show week to week as and, I do. I mean, it's people aren't going to be watching it week to week anymore. Well, right. You know, but that's how it is going to be originally viewed by, you know, it's, it's primary audience in Japan. But you've already pointed out that they get most of their money from people buying DVDs. True, but most you're not going to buy the DVD unless you watch the show on TV. Unless it's well written and reviewed. Well, I suppose you could, but I don't. Personally, at least for myself, I very rarely will buy something on DVD or Blu-ray unless I have seen it already. You know, unless it's something I've heard that is really excellent and is relatively cheap. I don't like blind buying, especially since anime DVDs are kind of expensive. So, but that's just me. I don't know how those Japanese otaku do it. Um but uh, episode fourteen had um, uh, what another really nice scene um, with Subaki and uh, Kosei on the beach, you know, where they were like walking on the beach just like they did when they were kids, and he, that's where he revealed to her that like he was gonna go to a music high school, and she talked about how you uh, can do that thing that you pushed me to do at the beginning of this show. Exactly, you know, music always takes Kosei away from me. I hate music, even though I totally made him get back into it. That's true. Well, that's that's kind of what's interesting. Subaki made him get back into it because she knew that. I mean, he was miserable in the first episode because, like, he wanted to stay away from the piano, but at the same time, he felt he needs the piano, so 
he was kind of in this weird place. So she wanted him to get back into it. But yeah, then it starts kind of, you know, he gets really into it to the point where she starts, he starts moving away from her. And like back in episode four, you saw when like Kaori and, uh, uh, Kosei looked at each other like smiling during their competition while they were doing the duet together. Subaki kind of got like this wide eyed look on her face because she could sort of tell like that there was something a little romantic going on there, you know. So Subaki kind of got them, got, like you said, got Kosei back into piano, got Kaori and Kosei to meet for the first time. And it kind of blows up in her face a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it is, it is, does all kind of come back to her. But that was another, like, another insert song comes in there, like a nice vocal song, you know, that plays over, like, this montage of Tsubaki's, like, memories with Kosei. You know, I liked how it, and it ended, too, with uh, this shot of, like, Kid um, Tsubaki having made, like, those two polished mud balls. Like, she was so proud of those because she was going to give one to Kosei or whatever in the past. So that was, that was a nice way to end that one off. Let's see here. And then 15 is where Nagi was introduced um, by attacking him with, like, a water balloon and I was really falling out of a tree. for a long time what her deal was. And even when they did explain it, it was still just so weird. I don't know. It, it, it's one of those – I kind of agree. Like, when I was watching it week to week to week, I was kind of a little confused about, like, why Nagi was being introduced. But looking on, like, the overarching point of the show – it actually did serve a pretty big point because it was there, you know, Seto wanted uh, Kosei to teach um, Nagi because, like, it was something that wouldn't give sorrow to his life, you know, something to channel, like, you know, something joyful, you know, in uh, in Kosei's life, you know, letting him improve himself by teaching somebody, you know, and getting the joy of, like, watching a student grow, you know, and then as well, he uses Nagi as an avenue to give hope back to Kaori, you know. And then to, you know, to also for her, for Nagi, to motivate Takeshi again. You know, so both of them, you know, go into that performance with somebody that they need to change, you know, and that and they accomplish that through what they do. So it serves its role in the show pretty well, I think. I I get all those things and it was nice seeing him have like, hey, this is the thing that does, brings my life something other than suffering and romance plot line. But I was annoyed and andrew was as well at how little cowrie was in this arc like oh, she barely yeah. she's shows like, up she's and like she was a, even, like she's still like treated as a central character she's supposed to be like the she's second never there. most main character and she's like barely present in the plot she's just dying in the hospital bed and being like a thing that he pines after but he can't go see it because he feels super awkward and because he's got all that angsty teenage crap going on and i'm like show stop that <laughs> stop nope nope stop Go yeah. commit to your main characters who you need to develop and you need to stop writing off the show for stupid plot well, threads that have nothing to do with anything else. Well, for one, I just went into all the reasons why the Nagi plot thread was important. I know why you went into all the reasons why it was important, and I, I get that. that. <laughs> it was. Anyway. But, but, and, and two, for when you look at the overarching point of the show, Kaori needed to like really go through, through some crap with the whole hospital stuff to get to this point. Where, you know, she says, press the reset button, you know, forget about me, you know, the doctors say, you know, it's not looking good for me, blah, blah, blah. Get her to this point where she, by that point in the show, she and Kosei flip positions the way they were at the beginning. She's the one living the monotone life who's, like, given up on her dream, and Kosei is the one who brings color back into it and, like, inspires her to you know dream again and to but they don't really do anything with that until the how very end or is. like how boring her life is other than yeah she just kind of sits around and then she calls him to talk about a stupid plane landing and i'm like okay, okay whatever that's well, dialogue guys I, I don't know for like for one as soon as like we saw Kauri in the hospital room like i like how they did like that weird like staticky flash like him seeing the mom in the hospital god, bed. It's like a Slenderman video. <laughs> oh my god, but she kept showing up. That's all she ever was. was a little like bit. A thing. Was and, like, uh, dying. <laughs> and, uh, and like, I like how Kari, like, when she's in the hospital room, it's partially just the lighting of the hospital room, but just her in general, like, they draw her with, like, more. It's very like, washed out. Yeah, wa- washed out is a good word for it, you know, because color is a very just important thing to the story and the, just the visual design of the show in general. So you definitely get that, that she's, you know, getting sicker you know i love the scene i think it's in it is in 17 yeah i think where um 
maybe this is 16, I don't know, where Kaori is walking through the hospital hallway and collapses and, like, her legs stop working and she's, like, pounding on her legs and, like, screams. No, like, legs. Go like, back to being legs. Like, the po- legs. she is literally, like, Leg- her body is falling apart. I think that's a pretty good justification for why she gets well, super depressed. But they don't really show anything. Like, the the, the she legs get thing is one of the only thing that happens other than they show her sitting in the bed and he stands around awkwardly and then leaves. Like, there's like, the leg thing, like there's she her get... sitting in the bed and looking super washed out coloring-wise, and those are some of the only things I can think of that they really do with her character during that arc to show how depressed no, she is. I can point out a couple things, like Kose talks about how, like, some of her, like, lines she was saying to Watari about, like, oh, yeah, I'll be back at school soon, like, sounded rehearsed. You know, you saw, like, some scenes after they left of, like, the but that's, nurse coming that's back him in. him saying something about what she said. That's not something that she did. That's him saying, that's Kose sitting there and pining after her. Well, the, the point being that he's, like, he has insight on her because he knows her so well. You know, that, like, she is lying about this. She's putting up a front for us, you know, because we're visiting her. You know, she's not actually, she's actually probably pretty damn depressed being in the hospital room and being well, all sick. Yeah, she is you know, probably really we depressed. S- we see some, we, there's, a de- there's a shot of her, like, trying to play the violin and, like, her bow falling out of her hand because she physically can't do it anymore, you know. Well, that was when she was, uh, Kose was talking to Nagi about, like, how amazing Kaori was when the two of them were on the steps of that temple, and they kind of, they cut to that at that point. Well, I mean, then what they could have done better would have been, like, either to give the main character some screen time about her, what she's thinking and dealing with it, instead of, you know, having, like... A couple flashes. A couple flashes, and then having the other main character narrate the entire show, like, it's a book on tape, and... I don't know. Maybe that I kind of was frustrating after a while. But and then also like, oh my god, what was, I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> I really did. Like, it has left after, the station. Yeah. Anyway, um, no, there's something else. Um, yeah. Also, like she could just like okay, so she needed more screen time because she was not getting any screen time to develop her mental state. Because like yeah, they're showing flashes of her being depressed, but like we're not getting any of that. We're not getting like where she is as a character. We're not getting it. We're getting we know, don't and get also, to see into her mind. Also, it would have been really interesting if she was like jealous of the girl that he was teaching, or like he's spending all this time playing piano with this girl. Well, instead of like helping me get through my depression, which I helped him get through his depression. You got something like that, but a little bit different. Um, One time they came over and she yelled at him like, why are you teaching this girl? You should be practicing more. You know, you're wasting valuable time. You know, you need to prepare for this competition because, you know, and then he thinks about like how like she's having like these crazy mood swings like her mom, his mom did back when she was sick, you know, and now Kauri's almost gotten to do what the doing what the mom did. Like I can't go and compete and practice and do all these things. So you should be doing it all the more because you need to be great and you need to, you know, practice hard because at least you can and I can't. And you need to go accomplish this, you know, because I know that you can do it. You know, so it, well, that wasn't a jealousy thing, but it was more of a, you know, why are you wasting your time doing this while I'm in here dying, <laughs> kind of thing. You don't understand how precious the time you have is. And I got that. I was just like, I just, for somebody so central to the plot, they just decided like, eh, we're going to write her off the plot for a while and switch main plots. And I'm like, show, you, you're starting to, it's starting to look like you're just trying to justify your 20 episodes. I don't know. Personally, I don't know. That that didn't bother me much because like, while, while Kaori may not have had tons of screen time in that episode in those episodes like there was enough there were certainly quite a number of scenes like i remember there was that whole bit where she came to the school and like took him shopping with her and because that was like her one day of the hospital that was that was towards the close of the of uh the little girl's arc anyway uh where was it uh no that was episode 16 that 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 arc doesn't end until 18 Hmm. so you know you're getting the time's a little off there i was gonna say because this was something that kind of confused me um at the end of 16 she she says you know do you want to commit double suicide with me which really kind of threw me yeah, for a loop that was a weird first thing oh, yeah, and sure. they don't we bring it up a whole, like they bring it up one more time ag- yeah they bring it up again but it's not like i feel like that could have easily been not there and it would have been 
yeah, it, it, know the worst for it. It is weird. Um, appa- researching a bit, she was reading a book that Kosei had checked out before. It's an actual book called Ichigo Dome, and I guess that's a quote from that book. Uh, I was reading that apparently that could also be translated as lover's suicide. So it's like a partial. It's like a so it's supposed to be like a tragic. Oh, you roma- want Romeo and Juliet? This stuff <laughs> basically it's supposed yeah, to be like a tragically or, tragically oh, yeah. romantic line of some sort, I guess. But also to express how like kind of depressed she was at that point. Um, and yeah, because that's when we started that conversation about that movie that I heard about. And and similarly in uh, seventeen, he walks by and he hears somebody playing Ravel, and he makes the point like, no, no, I don't want to like don't want Ravel or whatever. Apparently that was Ravel's Pavane for a dead princess. So it's like a requiem for the dead. That's why he was freaked out by that. It was just something that kind of went over my head as like somebody doesn't know much about classical music. So I had to look that up to get that. But, you know, so yeah, we get, we do get to the whole, you know, uh, competition with Nagi and uh, Kosei. You know, I really like how not, uh, cause, um, Nagi goes through this whole arc where she's like really uh, nervous about performing, you know, and the, everyone at school is either teasing her about it or like the teachers are saying, you know, you better do well, you know, to protect the reputation of our school kind of thing. And she's feeling the pressure and Seto kind of comforts her there. What? <laughs> uh, the amount of pressure that they put on these children in these shows. And it I get been really interesting of like a concept for a TV show. If that was what they were talking about. Well, Instead, they want it to be a, about a romance plot line and how it's you should get over that pressure and do it anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, they certainly don't ignore it. You know, every time they do one of these competitions, you see everybody in the hallways like freaking out and all of the characters kind of have this nervousness but before they the sort performances. Of deify it like, oh, that's that's going to happen and you need to overcome it because it's totally worth it for the payout. And you shouldn't care about your mental or physical health despite all of this. Also, big theme in Whiplash, which is why I kept drawing comparisons to that. <laughs> but, you know, Whiplash actually, like, Whiplash was almost exclusively about that as, like, a concept versus this show, which is, like you said, mostly about the romance plotline. And then that's, like, kind of a subplot, the side thing that they kind of want to talk about, but not really, or really feel like they want to commit to talking about how screwed up that can be. Yeah. Well, like, I think Cowrie talks later about how, like, uh, we're musicians, you know, we were good at struggling. You know, they don't, definitely don't dodge around the whole idea of, like, how kind of, uh, what's one of the paradoxical this whole musician thing is. Like, you know, you put all this effort into practicing, you know, for, like, your one moment in the sun, you know, but if you, like, screw it up a little bit, you know, then you're going to be dumped by the wayside kind of thing. You know, and clearly our, the characters we're following in the show are, like, prodigies. You know, they're all, like, the some of the best players in the show. And you they're know. all attending, and they all live in main character city where, it, where like, that many classical musicians can exist in the same space and not cannibalize each other's audience. You literally cannot throw a stone without hitting a <laughs> classical musician uh, who's almost world-renowned in that town. <laughs> I do kind of wonder, I don't know for certain if Takeshi and Emmy, like, are in that town or did they just travel there for the competitions? Uh, there were kids there. It so... seems an awful lot like uh, yeah, at least true. Takeshi and, and was the, there yeah, and, because and his, his sister, sister also lives there. No, Unless no. she just like roadies around with him. <laughs> no, you're right. Takeshi at the very least has to live in that town. Um, so yeah, you know, they, they have their performance, you know, the, the kind of the back and forth. I kind of like Takeshi's reaction to it where he was like, uh, you know, like he was he cried at one point like why are you doing this you know instead of me with my you know, little sister kind of thing like why are you the role model for her also why are you doing this super emotional thing and not being a robot god i like you so much better as a robot because then i can <laughs> pretend that you're my god <laughs> I, re- I remember i think it was in takeshi's flashback where he like first learned how to like play the piano his mom could basically bribe him to doing it because if she did she would buy him a chogiki robot it's yeah. like yeah i can agree with that learn yeah, no, that's okay. well, work. <laughs> learn yeah, piano yeah, to yeah, get toy okay. robot we do that um do x get y but and the, probably one of my favorite parts of that is near the end of that where they're playing um because uh, Watari has the cell phone, you know, that he's recording the music with, sending it to Kauri, and she, like, mm-hmm. stands up, you know, and starts, like, playing her invisible violin along with the music, you know. And the whole, you know, that was one of the big points of that whole Nagi arc. You know, Kosei goes back there, and she talks about how, like, you're a jackass, you know, that, you know, you're 
forcing me to you're making me dream after I had given up hope, you know. And I, I really like that arc because, like, once again, Kosei did to Kaori what Kaori did to him, you know, back in the early part of the show, you know, inspiring her to, you know, want to play again, want to, you know, dream again, which is very nice, you know. And that that is where they brought up the double suicide line again because he said, "I won't commit it with you because I just be following you, you know. I want to stand by your side, you know." They're, they go into that a lot, you know, how he feels like he's always trailing behind watching that back of hers, you know, but someday I'll be there, you know, by her side, her equal. Although apparently they're still not willing to admit to each other that they're really just in love. <laughs> of course. Well, I mean, obviously they get there by the end of the show, you know, but it takes that long. <laughs> but that's how these sorts of things work. You know, well, they could just not <laughs> try writing a different story. <laughs> well, I don't know. Good job. Try again. <laughs> yeah, well, like, for as much as it's a music show, I mean, the music is, like, the, you know, kind of side element. I mean, the main focus is the characters, you know, the romance. Like, that's what the show really is about, mm-hmm. you know. But the music is, is a very important element to it as well, <laughs> certainly. Um, and then we kind of enter into what I consider to be, like, the last arc, kind of the last four episodes, kind of just come into full circle with Kaori and Kosei's arcs. Um and that's about the time Subaki really starts uh, training hard, you know, to uh, get good grades so she can go to a high school near the musical high school that Kosei wants to go to. You know, we get there's a nice scene where Kaori's like in physical therapy, you know, and the parents like thank him because like because of his devotion to Kaori, you know, that's what's like inspired her to, you know, uh, take the next step kind of thing. And uh, and then it's like the December piano competitions and Takeshi, Kosei and Emmy are all there. And they kind of had this nice moment where they're just sitting down on the wall and they're like talking about what sandwiches they like. Mm. And you kind of get this idea that like, you know, they've gone from being like these rivals at the beginning to kind of. God, th- look how charismatic like, they are with each other. If only those two were, uh, talked to him more. Yeah. Like, I guess th- they're still rivals, but it's more of like a friendly rivalry at that point. You know, like, like a respectable, a respecting rival, mm. you know. They're the type who would pick pick your enemy off up off the floor because, you know, it wouldn't be any fun to beat you if you're not at your prime kind of thing. Mm. And, you know, Takeshi gets a big performance in the episode, you know, which was kind of like the redeeming thing for him because he'd been in that slump before Nagi did her performance. And she says at the end, welcome home, my hero. You know, so you get that, you know, there that arc's kind of come to a close, which is nice. Um, And then... uh. We get an uh, episode 20 is an important one because that's another one where like he wants to go visit Kaori, but Watari is there. So he feels like a third wheel. So he doesn't go. Um, but she, uh, she like uh, calls him on the phone, you know, and they talk about like seeing the airplane in the sky, that, that whole shtick. Um, but I, I like that because he like said, like, it doesn't matter about time. Like I want to see you, you know, like he, the, <clears throat> By that point in the show, they're not like dodging around their feelings as much. You know, it's, I mean, they're being more, more frank with it, even if they don't, you know, flat out say, I love you, like we want them well, to. Because she's like, you know, like dying, mm-hmm. like of plot Pl- disease right then and there. Plot cancer, everyone's favorite. <sighs> um, and th- that is kind of important because um, there's that scene between Tsubaki and Kosei in the rain where um, she asks him, like, do you like Kaori? And he says, yeah, I do. And then she's like, why do you, th- why do you like Kaori? She's into Watari. You know, that's just stupid. You're just a stupid fool. Uh, you have no choice but to love me. And he uh. kind of gets a what the crap look on his face. And then she kicks him and runs away <laughs> in a very Subaki ish way. But that was, I mean, that's basically her confessing her feelings to him, her mm-hmm. taking that first step that she had always, you know, talked about, like letting time flow forward, you know, which is a nice moment for her character for sure. You know, beautiful shots there once again. You know, I mean, the show, everything about the show looks really pretty. Um, and there was a a nice moment there, too, where um, w- he was with Watari and he told Watari that he liked Kaori. And he's like, yeah, I know, you know, <laughs> like I've always like, it, known. It was really obvious. <laughs> it really kind of was, you know, but like, like you said, like Watari is kind of like a wingman for Kosei because he talks about how, like, I forget which point it was. You know, you need to go visit her because, you know, you're the one she always comes to, you know, not me, you know, so you need to go there and visit her and talk to her. Mm-hmm. You know, the girl will tell you if it's impossible, you know, if it was for a girl I liked, I'd slurp up muddy water, 
mm-hmm. you know, and that was that was a nice moment for Watari. You know, I would definitely say of the main characters, he's the one who gets the least development. He doesn't really go through an arc of any sort. It really kind of drops off the face there for a while. I mean, there were some nice parts with him where, like, he lost his, like, big game. He's like, well, there goes my chance at becoming uh, known for being a soccer player. Now you have to become known for being something because I'm just going to be a washed-up hack even though I'm 14 years old. God. <laughs> that, 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 that did always yeah. bother me. Like, you know, dude, there's a life beyond middle school. There's a thing called high school where you could, you know, God. accomplish and I mean, there's nothing matter. after high school. Don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Chances are, with the amount of stress you're all under, you won't make it past high school. A- anime always end at graduation. There's nothing past that. Don't worry about it. Nope. <laughs> that is literally the end of the world. <laughs> that. There yep. you go. Um, but then that episode kind of ends. Like, uh, Kosei and Watari are walking to see her at the hospital room. They talk about that. You know, they're being bros. And then she's like, uh, has to go to the ICU and like is having a, again. having a heart attack or some such. And then the cat gets hit by a car, which is just like even more just like, do you get that it's sad yet? <laughs> yeah. Do you get the that. death of the innocence and the, the I wasn't childhood that. trauma? I was like, that was unnecessary. Sure, that was uncalled for for killing the cat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay if we kill a cowrie, but killing the cat, that's yeah. too much. Yeah, well, they beat you over the head with, she's going to die, you're going to feel sad about it. And I'm like, I'm not going to feel sad because they made it pretty obvious for a long it. time. But the cat didn't deserve it, and the cat was too heavy-handed. Like, that was taking it too far, because that is, like, a weirdly, like, just, that's an unnecessary amount of ham-fistedness. It's I, like, and then my day got even worse, guys. I don't know. I I, I think the reason I kind of liked it was because how, like, the, the very last scene played where, like, Kosei was, like, totally quiet, like, you know, uh, he had, like, those really weird, like, despairing-looking eyes when he was talking to, like, the veterinarian, and then he went to, like, that park and, like, washed his hands. Oh, and it was just kind of... spot. Just, like, kind of... Qu- it was just, like, there was, like, no dialogue there. It was just kind of quietly playing, but you just kind of saw his, his, like, sadness, like, progress, you know, as he was, like, looking at his hands, which was, were all bloody just a second ago with the cat's blood, you know, and then he, like, collapses there and, you know, cries a bit. And, like... I agree that it's like the whole cat thing is a little heavy handed, but because that scene was that last scene was kind of done a little more subtly, you know, it wasn't just like him screaming to the sky, you know, shown in style, you know, that made it, that made it work for me. Uh, and then, um, uh, by episode 21, Kose is like, you know, back into depression land, basically, you know, uh, and understandably so because he's, you know, just kind of like, no matter what I do, you know, the people I love leave me. It's almost like I'm doomed to live some main characterish life of sorrow. <laughs> I know. How about that? Hmm. Uh, Mangaka, could you help me with that, please, Mister Creator? Um, but uh, is suffering. But there's a there's a nice scene where like uh, Kauri invites him back to the hospital, and she like has him take her up to the roof, and uh, he talks about how like music takes the people I love away, you know. And I haven't been like practicing for like a week, you know. I can't do like that competition. It'd be a miracle if I could play right. And then, uh, and then Kauri shows him a miracle, you know, standing up and then like playing her phantom violin, you know, which is another like very nice emotional scene. But doctors won't stop you from taking a cancer patient up to a freezing rooftop. (laughs) Of course not. (laughs) God, it's a good thing they put fences on that rooftop because I (laughs) thought they were going to do that double suicide thing. (laughs) No, they moved beyond that, man. Come on. Oh, are you sure? Because. Yeah. I think at that point they had, you know, if this had been back at episode 16, I might've been a little worried about her going to the rooftop. Um, but I, I did really like how they, um, you know, Kose went to the piano competition and he was, you know, go to do it, but still feeling like really messed up to the point where Takeshi and Emmy were like, dude, are you okay? Like you look like you're going to pass out, you know, but he goes up there anyways, you know, uh, like can't play, you know, almost kind of like he did back when he first, uh, his mom died and he lost the ability to hear the notes, you know, but then he realizes like, you know, I have other people to play for, you know, everyone else who supported me, who, you know, who's made my life fulfilled, you know, I'm going to play for their sake, you know, and he, he plays his nice Chopin piece as we cross cut between that and like the surgery that Kauri is going through, which was nice. Then she dies. Of course she does. In the last episode, because that's totally worth it. (laughs) Well, it would have been, it would have been a cop out if she hadn't died. Or, if if because they said like this was a super dangerous surgery, and even if it worked, it would give her a little bit more time, but it wouldn't save her. That's kind of what I thought they were gonna do, but it seems like they just kind of made it so she actually just died in the surgery, you know, and that's that. 
That's uh, I mean, even if they did just like give her a few, a little bit more time, I'm like, well, whoop de do, and now you're gonna end, and it's just with the implication that she's gonna die here shortly, and that doesn't like, like create the hope that you want out of that. Like, nah. shouldn't that like, yeah, this will fix it, and then she dies, and you're like, well, okay, we almost had it. Well, then now it, we're sad. It's probably good that they didn't do that then. I guess no. Because then you're implying that there's hope, and then you crush that hope in front of the viewer instead of just like, yeah, it's don't worry about it. She's gonna die. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, this this show, you know, from from pretty early on, once you realize that Kauri has this sickness, it becomes pretty obvious that this is less a rom com, maybe, and more of a you know tragedy. And it certainly plays off as as that, you know, by the end of the show, I would say. And I I think that might be one of my bigger problems with the show, where. I find it irritating that literally everything he does pretty much has to lead to suffering and like, oh, of course she's going to die. They can't just have a relationship in the show. It can't, like, why? Why Why did she have to have plot cancer? Was that... Well, I think it was because... It's a storytelling trope that annoys me. <laughs> well, but it worked in Clannad, didn't it? Yeah, because they did it well. They did do it well. They I... did it better than this. I would say they did do better than this because is a better show than this. But, uh, I, I mean, I do think it played well because, you know, the whole parallel with the mom thing. And, you know, like I said, like, the doing the whole sickness thing totally flips their dynamics as characters, you know, to the point where, you know, Kaori's the one who needs to be helped, you know, and Kosei is in the position, the stronger position, you know, to help her rather than vice versa like it was at the beginning. You know, and it, it is so sad because Kaori is such a bubbling, like, energetic you know, character that you come to love in those early episodes, you know, that it is really sad when you see her with the gray muted colors, you know, by the end, you know, he talks about how she's so light to carry up, you know, I mean, you, you really get the idea that this is something that's inevitable. And I think, you know, unlike Clannad, which had very clear magic and, you know, fantasy in its world, this one is very clearly grounded in reality. And so, you know, barring some sort of deus ex machina miracle there's no way to save her she was gonna die no matter what anyone did unless some doctor found the cure <laughs> but um i would because you know once again i literally just watched the last episode a few hours ago we just watched it here again before the podcast uh and they clearly saved up some budget for this last episode because that whole first half with that performance was like stunning like visually yeah, you know, that was very really pretty. pretty very pretty you Audibly know and visually. great great music i i, I kind of like how they didn't you know they made they made it uh without dialogue you know it's like this emotional moment between the characters kind of this climax of the show but it was played all through their looks and the occasional thought from kosei in his head and the music you know because i talked about how music is stronger than words you know in the show a lot so you know the music communicates their emotions in that final moment which i think it was an effective way to do it, you know, and seeing Subaki, you know, fade away there was definitely a uh, a hard moment to watch for me. Uh, and then we get the, you know, this letter that she has at the end that, you know, explains, as we talked about, you know, the whole My Lie in April, you know, about the fact that I actually, you know, knew about you from the beginning. I kind of like how... Because like every other musician in this town, she was fundamentally altered as a child by Kosei. Yeah. I do think that's kind of cool because, like, I, you know, I'm sure if I go back and watch that episode that was about Emmy, you know, she's sitting there next to her where she, like, freaks out and cries. Probably. I think you, I you know, And so, that. you know, that's kind of, like, subtle foreshadowing of, like, Kaori as a kid that you just totally blank over, you know, way back then. Um... But, you know, I, I mean, I, I do think that played out, you know, nicely, you know, kind of showing how uh, how kind of desperate Kaori was, you know, from the very beginning. Like, you know, because it's your typical it's typical in a romance show that, you know, the main character really wants, you know, such and such, you know, to be their romantic interest in there, you know, pursuing them. But in this case, it was kind of that. But it was also Kaori secretly like loved Kosei from the beginning. You know, or at least she didn't love Kosei from the beginning. She wanted to get closer to Kosei because she admired him. It was after actually spending time with him and getting to know him that she fell in love with him. You know, but uh, but that whole that whole bit with the letter definitely played out well. I do think it is kind of funny. You know, there's this is like maybe one of the only shows where the um, the childhood friend character who's 
plays second fiddle to the lead uh, female actually wins in the end. You know, if we're talking about shipping battles here, Subaki seems to come out on top because she lives. The other one dies. <laughs> yeah. Also, they're 14. Literal 20 exa- bucks says it doesn't last. Um, literal example of die for our ship. <laughs> Indeed. Go down with the ship, whether it's burning or not. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. I liked all that. You know, she had, like, that flash where she was, like, talking about all the times they shared, you know, like, running along the tr- – running by the train, jumping off the bridge, you know, will you ever forget me, you know. She says, I love you, and I'm sorry, you know, for every for kicking you, for doing all those things. Thank you for, you know, being with me. You know, get that, that picture of her and her friend with, like, Kosei running in the background, you know, which was kind of nice because in the second opening – we had always seen like the last shot is of like an open letter on a piano, and I kind of wondered what that was. So it was nice to see that you know come full circle. Uh, kind of funny how um, Kawashima, who's Sabaki's friend, who had been like advising her about love this whole show, like she asks her, "Oh, like what's your uh, what's the secret to you knowing all this about love?" And she's like, "BL, you know, I read boys love manga." <laughs> so that's that's the secret to her uh, romantic advice, apparently. Um. So, you know, that's kind of what that's what wrapped up the show. Um, And like I said, for me, like this is a show that I found to be like really, you know, beautiful, both on a you know visual and audible level, you know, as well as on an emotional level. You know, it definitely connected with me. I've kind of I don't really know that much about classical music, but I'm interested enough in it to enjoy a show that focuses on it. You know, I really love the musical performances in the show. So this was one that like from the moment I started watching it, like back in. Ooh, November, whenever it started, you know, I was kind of on board from from episode one. I knew I was going to like it, you know, watching it week to week. You know, it had its ups and downs here and there, but kind of what as I did my rewatch before the podcast, you know, seeing it all at once, I do think it kind of that second half flows together better. And I really see where the overarching story took them, you know, because uh, one thing I really m- admire is that Kosei and Kaori are like completely different characters by the end than they were at the beginning. Like they definitely went through, you know, several arcs over the course of the show. You know, Tsubaki goes through an arc, you know, less pronounced, I think, than them. Watchery doesn't really go through an art- arc, you know, but Takeshi and Emi and Nagi definitely go through arcs, you know, are kind of side lead characters. You know, so the show does a you know good job with its characterization, you know, and its, you know, production quality definitely elevates it. Uh, beyond a lot of other shows that I've seen a lot of other rom-coms. So I really like the show. You know, it's not the greatest thing ever, but it's probably like top 20 worthy, I would say for me. Peter, what are your kind of thoughts? Uh, it's a, it's a very pretty anime and I really enjoyed the music. Uh, I gave up on be on my like playing music pretty early on. So a lot of the things that they tried to convey, like uh, play your play the place you want to talk about and stuff like that. Um, a lot of those are kind of lost on me. Um, and I'm not a huge fan of romance and slice of life, life things, unless they're really well written. And, uh, this one was pretty good, but not enough to be something that I would have watched past a little while. Uh, it was enjoyable, but nothing fantastic. But if you enjoy romance, com- rom- romantic comedies or slice of life stuff, then this is beautiful and, uh, fantastic music and, a good one of those so hey and andrew what would you say so i have some problems with the show some plot problems some character problems but overall it is a good show and i can't complain too too much about it it does set up its premise pretty well it executes the you know she's gonna die thing you see well there are enough subtle hints that does understand what the word subtlety means which i appreciate um it is beautiful the animation's gorgeous the lighting like you said is great the shot composition i noticed a lot too was really mm-hmm. great um the music was awesome but you expect that from a show about music you'd be actually really disappointed if you want it suffers, yeah. it suffers from some small problems like I, I feel like it would have been better if it was 12 episodes mm, i don't know i mean that would have it would have to, to rush cowrie's like character development See, though to I make you care about her if cut out a bunch of other characters or just cut out some the of the end. other people's but then we would then we couldn't have had takeshi and emmy and i really like them as characters i no, i think we could have kept them i think we could have dropped the sister the sister uh, and a lot of the episodes about um uh, f- about them being about, kids and about uh the childhood friend 
because a lot of them were just treading the same ground. She together really again. could. Have, they really could have condensed her down to one episode, and then that would have been like her whole character point, and then you would have gotten where she's coming from and where yeah. she was going. Yeah, I do kind of agree with that to an extent because like there was definitely there was that episode where um, he was playing Claire de Lune after uh, Senpai had dumped uh, Tsubaki and she was like crying to him and, you know, being all sad. And she talked about like, I'm going to, you know, move forward, take that first step. Time's going to start going. But then, you know, it it doesn't really, you know, move forward until episode 20 where she you know kind of confesses to him. And then she says time's moving forward. But it's like, well, you said that back then. So what you know has it really just been like static between now and then, you know? So I I mean I I agree to an extent with that. Although you know I do like like Subaki's character. You know she's a likable character, and like a lot of those scenes, like the scene on the beach, you know that scene in the piano room, like they're just very beautiful, and you definitely get like you know get where the characters are coming from there. You know their emotions. I guess. Another thing they could have done to cut it down is stop doing that. Hey, we'll repeat the last five minutes of the show, of last episode, in the first five minutes of this episode, and stop and not say all the things that we got the first time via just inference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will agree. I will say that one time that I definitely think it worked was because in episode four, like it literally cut from you know, them, the audience clapping after their performance to Sabaki, like on the, not Sabaki, Kaori on the ground, like, like she had collapsed. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was kind of weird because he was like, saw Kosei's shadow, like over her body and all that. And then when they did episode five, like they showed a bit of that again, and it showed, okay, they were walking off stage and then she collapsed, you know? So I I like that just to give like, like you, they didn't need to show that part because you inferred that she would have walked like th- walking up. Like what is the difference between she stands there and falls and she's walking off the stage and falls? Like, what is the difference there? I don't know. It, it just, it, it confused me a little bit. Yeah, and I was really confused. I'm like, I feel like we covered this already. Yeah. yeah well, I, I was talking about more like the, exactly. Like sh- suddenly she's on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. No, I because them. I feel yeah. Like I got that. But okay. Whatever. <laughs> Joe, okay. I know it's it's a detail thing, but um, yeah. So glad we were able to talk about this one. Like I said, this is one that I've mm-hmm. been you know watching and enjoying a lot as it's been going. Um, as far as next time, um, I'm not totally sure. Um, I talked to um Kenny and uh, Clara about doing Psychopaths two because you know that finished up a while ago and they really like Psychopaths one, but they haven't seen Psychopaths two, and I know you guys. You still haven't finished Psycho nope. Pass, right, Andrew? I He's really tried three to. times. I keep <laughs> trying, and then I keep getting distracted by things. <laughs> see. Well, I do have it on Blu-ray, so I could loan that to you if you really wanted to. I mean, it's on Netflix, but, I mean, I guess. Having a physical copy is a good compulsion, because eventually you have to give it back to him, or else he'll cut your hands off. That's true. That's true, I, I will. watch it on my computer. <laughs> we have a television. Well, yeah, but then I'm taking the television away from you guys. At least you guys want to watch Psycho Pass. Well... Mm. I think Pete at least would enjoy Psycho Pass. I know about the rest of your, your yeah, apartment. Yeah, Ryan probably would end, would, end up, would end up liking it as well. He would like it. Yeah. I know. It is kind of violent, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, he watched The Raid with us. Okay, well, then, yeah, it's uh, not a problem. Right. <laughs> but, uh, so, I'm, I don't know. Touching. Either we. <laughs> we're, I feel, it is really <laughs> a it, touching it, experience. It makes <laughs> me feel emotions that I never have felt since. <laughs> or ever probably will again, unless it's Raid 3. <laughs> well, no, there's going to be the American version that's going to make me feel a little oh, different type of emotion. That's, that's going to be... Di- no, I felt those emotions a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's the remake that's worse than the original. We've seen that already. But um, So I'm thinking either next week we'll either do Psycho Pass 2 or um, maybe we'll do Psycho Pass 2 in two weeks because it's only 11 episodes, um, so it wouldn't be that long to watch. Uh, and then maybe next week we'll do a, uh, another version of our top 10 anime list because oh, it's been kind of... <laughs> well, no, <laughs> I may have no. I well, I have a top fifty list. I, I've axed the top uh, seventy-five list. No, I meant like is that our seventy-fifth episode? Because I know that that was coming up. Uh, oh yeah, I guess next week is our twenty seventy-fifth episode. So yeah, let's do that. That 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 fits nicely because you know every at least we didn't 25. do it. We did it for fifty, didn't we? Uh, yes, we did actually. So yeah, it'll be twenty-five episodes later. There we go. Because. Uh, uh, because we've done it, we did a top ten list my sophomore year, and then did it my junior year, and now I think it makes sense to do another one senior year because we've seen you know more shows yeah, that deserve to be on crazy. that top ten list. 
So I've watched Davis since then. <laughs> you have indeed. <laughs> so then we're gonna have we're gonna have Cowboy discussions. And I haven't seen all of Cowboy Bebop still. So I've seen both of those well, shows. Since Bebop, then, so. Bebop has been on the list in the past. Now you'll just be able to agree. Well, now yes, I will Bebop just like yes deserves to be put, there. Put it higher. So okay, yeah. So next time we'll do the top ten list. That should be fun, and then we'll do second yeah. best two. And after that, I don't know. We'll kind of have to see because there's not many weeks left in the school year, so not many more podcasts to do. Sadly, no. <laughs> I know. I'll have to pass the torch on to Andrew yeah. as host of Shredded Cells. Uh, I have to be in charge of this, <laughs> and then you can plug both of your shows, and you can argue with yourself about plugging your show. I could <laughs> argue with me about plugging my own show. Which one should I oh, plug dare more? Me. Plug my show. On my podcast. <laughs> there we go. All right. So if you enjoyed this podcast, you can email us at techheads at avwproductions.com. You can follow us on Twitter at techheads.ou. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us good ratings and reviews. We always like to hear from you guys. So thank you very much for listening to this episode, and we will see you guys later. This product is copyright AVW Productions 2019-2020.